Let's talk about some of the diseases linked to riboflavin deficiency as well. Now, I mentioned migraine earlier, so we'll, we'll add that to this page because we know migraine headache um, is something that riboflavin can contribute to. But one of the things riboflavin can contribute to is bone loss or fractures. So if you've got a diagnosis of osteoporosis, if you find or you've got a history of, of easy breaks without really major trauma, you know, you might be thinking vitamin B2. Cancers. Remember what I said earlier, vitamin B2 regenerates glutathione. Glutathione is a very powerful anti-cancer nutrient. And so if you're not getting adequate B2, you're not regenerating glutathione. You're increasing the risk for the development of cancer. Preeclampsia. Um, Preeclampsia, which is kind of a form of high blood pressure of, of pregnancy, is, is another component, and, and really vitamin B2, but also I'll just throw this in as bonus, magnesium. The two of those together can form a preeclampsia situation, which can make it very, very dangerous for pregnant women. Oftentimes, women with, with pregnancies are hospitalized over preeclampsia, so you want to be aware that B2 deficiency can cause that. So if you think about Women, if you've had babies and you think about each time you, you develop preeclampsia, you might think magnesium and vitamin B2 in that way. Anemia. Um, vitamin B2 is necessary to help form red blood cells properly. So a lot of times what can happen is a deficiency in the formation of, of adequate red blood cells, and that can lead to anemia, which leads to lack of oxygen, which leads to fatigue. So just another way that it can affect you. Diabetes. Remember what I showed you on the previous page about you know processed food, that FAD grabbing hydrogen from glucose. If you don't do that, the glucose stays as glucose. Your body will convert some of it to fat, but it will some of it will also stay in your bloodstream. Glucose makes your bloodstream sticky. It sticks onto your proteins called it's called glycation. When when too much sugar in your bloodstream starts to attach itself to the proteins and the hormones that circulate in your bloodstream, elevating your blood sugar contributing to the development of diabetes. Seborrheic dermatitis, I said earlier that riboflavin deficiency, one of the symptoms is inflammation of the skin. Well, this is one of the specific diseases, is seborrheic dermatitis. So if you've been to your dermatologist, they've looked at your inflammation on your skin and they gave you this diagnosis, you might think vitamin B2 deficiency. Cataracts, those of you who've had cataract diagnoses, vitamin B2 contributes to the health of, uh, of your lens and of your eyes. High blood pressure, we mentioned that a minute ago, which isn't it ironic that um, a lot of the treatments for high blood pressure, so again, the diuretic, the diuretic, let's make room because this is worth drawing. Diuretic reduces B2. It doesn't just reduce B2, it reduces B1. It reduces CoQ10, it reduces magnesium, it reduces calcium, it reduces potassium. That's not vitamin K, by the way, that's potassium, okay? And other B vitamins like B12 and folate and B6. And in so doing, in so doing, in so doing to treat the blood pressure, so this is used to treat blood pressure, we reduce all these nutrients. Well, guess what? B1 deficiency causes high blood pressure, HTN, that stands for hypertension. CoQ10 deficiency causes hypertension. Magnesium deficiency causes hypertension. Calcium deficiency causes hypertension. Potassium deficiency causes hypertension. B12 folate and B6 deficiency increase homocysteine, which causes vascular inflammation, leading to an increased risk for stroke and heart attack. So you can see Again, I, I'm not anti-medicine, but I'm anti, let's just say, intelligent thought processes. You've got to think this through. A diuretic is not a long-term solution to a condition like high blood pressure that is lifestyle-induced. You have to change your diet. You have to change your lifestyle. You've got to lose the weight if you're overweight, and then you won't need this. Again, it's the long-term use of those diuretics that really start to massively deplete the nutritional status. So if you're trying, if your goal is to reduce heart disease, through the medication, but you end up causing heart disease, okay, through the medication, then you're not getting anywhere. You're actually losing that, that battle. So those are the big things. These are, those are the big conditions linked to vitamin B2 deficiency. There's another 
condition, and this is kind of more of a rare thing, brown Violetto von Lohr syndrome, which is a form of neurological disease. We won't get into that because it's, it's, it's pretty rare. It's you know one of the rare conditions. Let's talk next about food. What can you do to eat more vitamin B2? Number one rule, understand this, vitamin B2 is rich in meats and vegetables. So if you've got a diet that's consistently good in whole foods, right? Whole foods, meats, vegetables, nuts, you're probably gonna be decently covered as it relates to riboflavin. The biggest places we see deficiency is in when people are caloric restriction mode. So you're not eating enough, okay? So you're just not getting enough overall calories and not getting enough vitamin B2 in that, in that caloric restriction. We'll see it in people who, again, remember what I said earlier, diuretics or caffeine, those types of things, okay? And we'll see it with processed diets. These are the big, kind of the most common, right? But if you're eating whole real food, you're not generally going to need a diuretic. Um, you may be doing caloric restriction, but if you're underweight or if you're losing weight rapidly or if you're, if you're working your way from an obese state to a normal weight, caloric restriction can actually be helpful. Um, but you do want to make sure that if you're doing that, if you're working with a doctor, that you're measuring your vitamin status so that you don't run into this problem. But these are the foods. Okay, these are some foods that you can eat more of. They're bang for bang, right? Bang for buck. These are going to have more vitamin B2 in them. So leafy greens, mushrooms, seaweed, pastured eggs, broccoli, green beans, bell peppers, almonds, sweet potatoes, salmon, sardine, Brussels sprout, and winter squash. Now you could add a lot of other things to this list, but these are really high in vitamin B2. So if you have a diet rich or enriched with these different foods, you should be covering some pretty good bases along the lines for need for B2. Now let's talk next um, about vitamin B2. Maybe some of you are supplementing or are interested in supplementing. What do we look for? What do we look for in terms of a high quality uh, riboflavin or vitamin B2 supplement? Well, the first thing we look for is a compound called riboflavin. And don't stop there. So a lot of supplement brands, they stop here. They put riboflavin in, but what we want is we want phosphorylated riboflavin. So riboflavin 5-phosphate. That's what you're looking for on your supplement. That term, this is the most bioactive form of vitamin B2. It's the most bioactive. It's one that your body recognizes best. Okay, now the, the RDA or the RDI for, for riboflavin, meaning that the daily, recommended daily intake according to the government it, for men is about one and a half milligrams a day. I think this is too low, personally. Um, understand where these recommended daily allowances come from as they come from, um, they come from old research that was designed to make people who had frank overt disease, you give them just enough where the frank overt disease is not, uh, is, is not something that we can measure through symptoms anymore, but it doesn't mean their riboflavin levels are optimized. So my, my advice is if you're looking to optimize your levels, especially if you're fit and active, 30 to 50 milligrams a day is kind of a good place to, to look at it. And so sometimes you'll, you'll find, you know, riboflavin in solo supplement form, uh, which some people opt to do, take it by itself. But I like it best in a B complex because B complex works together. The B vitamins, especially B6, folate, B12, and B2, they work very synergistically with each other. And so, and so you want, you know, you want to take that B complex to get them all so they're all working together for you. But most B complexes are going to contain, you know, at least that quantity of riboflavin. Uh, in them. And so that's a good place to start just in terms of, of making sure you're getting a good quantity each day. Nobody's ever died or even nobody's ever really experienced major symptoms of riboflavin toxicity. There are no uh, toxicities of riboflavin reported in the literature for, from supplement use. So it's not something that we would expect anybody really to ever overdose on if you're keeping it reasonable. Now, certainly the law of toxicity states that anyone 
who takes anything in high enough quantities for long enough periods of time can become toxic in it. So if you're taking, you know, a thousand milligrams of riboflavin a day and you don't have any justification for that, you, you know, that's probably not a smart move. But if you're staying in this range somewhere here, okay, this 30 to 50 milligram, even going up as high as 100 milligrams a day, um, you're probably going to be just fine. You'll have very yellow urine, as I mentioned before. You'll have very yellow urine, and that's normal. What that means, if your urine is super yellow, here's the good news about that. It doesn't mean you're peeing away your vitamins. It means that your GI tract, okay, your GI tract absorbed it. Okay, why? How can we know that? It means because it's coming out, yellow urine comes out the kidney, right? So we know it had to get from your GI tract to your blood so that then your kidney could filter it. If, if you didn't have yellow gear, and I would be more concerned if you're taking uh, a B-complex or you're taking higher doses of riboflavin. So we're actually, as a marker to look for GI tract health, we're looking for yellow urine. It's, you know, because if you don't have it and you're taking a strong uh, multi or B-complex, then you might have a GI problem uh, that is creating malabsorption, malnutrition, and that riboflavin is never making it into your bloodstream. So much more concerned if this is the issue than not having that yellow urine. Again, riboflavin, you need some every day. It has a very short half-life and very poor storage, so you need a little every day, and it's a very important to maintain that normal function. Something else you should know, uh, riboflavin is relatively heat-stable, so when you cook your foods, some, you know, some people say, you know, the raw food diet movement will say, oh gosh, if you cook your food, it loses all the nutrients. No, riboflavin is heat stable. You don't cook the riboflavin necessarily out of your food. Number two, there are some foods that are preserved with ethylene um, oxide, which is a chemical gas, and this is usually like dried fruit. So if you're a dried fruit fanatic, if you're buying the, you know, the dried mango or the raisins or whatever it might be, if they're gassing that fruit with this compound, you're actually destroying the vitamin B2. But vitamin B2 is destroyed by this compound. So my advice on dried fruit, make your own. Get yourself a dehydrator. Super easy to make dried fruit. And uh, without all the garbage, without the processed chemicals and everything else that might come with it. So, Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.